afternoon, everybody. My name is Abhishek Bali. Uh, I manage the 3D Experience Lab. Uh, for the 3D Experience Lab is the startup accelerator and open innovation program of the SOAR systems. But the, one of the reasons that I'm here is that uh, I'm an industrial designer myself, and design is very close to my heart. Uh, and you know, once you are a designer, you can never be an undesigner. So I thought, you know, let, let's come here and let's uh, you know, kind of feel the vibration of the design uh, capital of the world. Uh, let me start with uh, a very quick note on what we are go going to do today. So we have brought a session called How to Design for Everyone. Everyone is a consumer, a user of a product, but when you design for everyone, uh, you are not designing for just one kind of person, but there's a lot of other considerations that need to be taken into account. Uh, and we have a great speaker who will tell you about, more about this. Um, so at, during, like in my everyday role, I, I work with two different kinds of people. Like these are two create, creative fraternities. One is uh, startups, and we are incubating amazing startups like Girolift and Eel Energy that we have brought here. But the other important chunk of creative people I work with every day is makers. And who are these makers? In fact, this is the place that I actually... Uh, manage, uh, but who are these makers? These are hobbyists and you know people who have a nine to six job um, could be desk, desk related, but they find out the time in their spare time during the weekends and holidays to work on their passions. And these are the guys that we really facilitate uh, through our relationship with MIT's Center for Bits and Atoms and Fab Foundation, where in the source systems and SolidWorks we give free software to all the potentially 1,600 labs in the Fab, Fab Foundation network. Uh, in fact, not only that, we have, uh, every year we sponsor one Fab Lab. And in fact, I was trying to map them. And coincidentally, if you assume that the Earth is flat, they are in one straight line. So Bhutan was last year, Rwanda was two years back. And this year in January, I was in the southernmost city of the world in Chile called Porto Williams. And we started a lab with a fab lab with MIT. So why we do this is because we, we believe in, in you know, giving power to the people because um, you know, on one hand, we are giving the same software to Boeing and Airbus and all the you know, industry traction makers, I would say. But on the other hand, we also believe that innovation in the, in the next uh, century and in this century, of course, will come from people. And we want to give the right tools to the right people, to the creative minds. And also we know, because I manage a fab lab myself, that when people collaborate and they have an open approach, open innovation, they create better products. So, so you know, without further ado, let me just introduce uh, who we have brought today. He's a great guy, Enrico Bassi. Uh, he's the director of OpenDot, uh, which is one of, the, one of the biggest. I think it was the first fab lab in Italy. It's located in Milan. And this photograph is very interesting because this is from 2014 when he had made one of his bicycles. And on this day, we announced, like the Source Systems announced our partnership with Fab Foundation and MIT. Uh, and we started uh, you know, contributing uh, to the whole ecosystem. So Enrico. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, my objective here is to bring back the focus on people. And that's the final mission of a designer, is to find a solution that fits the need of a person. And uh, digital fabrication and, in general, parametric software allows us to do that. So. This is the place where I work. Uh, it's actually not the first Fab Lab, but I used to manage the first Fab Lab in Italy. Uh, it's here in Milan. It's a huge open space with the technologies on one side, the studio on the end, uh, a kitchen where we cook together, and a place where everybody can stay and work. So we were already pointing out one of the main focus and strengths of Fab Labs, that is the network. What you see here is the first and larger network of uh, fabrication that is not just distributed factories, but is distributed knowledge. 
that we can implement when we share knowledge, file, and technologies. And as you can see, it goes from one corner to the world to the other. Of course, there's a huge concentration in Europe and the US, but that's, that's not the only place. So virtually every lab that you see pointed out here can send the information to another lab to fabricate something locally, fitting the needs of the person that they are working with. And this, as designers, uh, I am a designer myself, and um, what uh, they told us in university is that we are industrial designers. So uh, very often we work for uh, industries and companies. And the production system is very structured, very uh, mechanical, yeah. very standardized. That's a great way uh, to be efficient. It's not always a great way to be effective. So what happened in Fab Labs is that instead of following uh, marketing research, we speak with people. So the capability of adjust uh, your design to fit the specific need of someone um, allows you to better target that, that request. And co-design is a very well-known strategy. We are trying to bring it not just um, outside of design, but into other sectors like healthcare, for instance, that really, really needs to be uh, innovated. The technologies in Fab Lab are not the most advanced. I'm very happy to say this. The objective is not to be um, at the edge of the new technologies. The objective is to be accessible. So technologies must empower people, because uh, if technologies allows only <coughs> 10 people in the world to do amazing things, that's not innovation. It's, it's innovative, but it has no impact on the, on the real people. So what we use every day is really simple technologies that everybody can learn, or at least uh, try to start to play with in a couple of hours. So 3D printer, laser cutters, um, simple electronics as Arduino, and so on. And of course, parametric software. So if we have flexible technologies mean, but we have uh, very rigid uh, design tools, then we have a gap again. And, and that's a huge problem that we have to overcome. And luckily for us, there's a very interesting, important companies working in this direction. So I want to tell you one of the projects that we worked uh, on during this year. It's something I really care about. I think it's probably one of the most satisfying projects we've done. And is the collaboration with uh, TOG, together to go, is a foundation here in Milan that takes care of kids with uh, physical limitations. So these kids have trouble to eat, to speak, to communicate with the parents, sometimes to stand or even to sit down. And, and for a kid, this is you know, a huge problem for a family as well. And simple solutions sometimes can enable and change this and has a huge impact on the life of these kids. So they, we met almost uh, randomly by chance, and it was great luck. And they had this uh, interest in 3D printing, small uh, orthesis that could uh, improve the posture of these kids. So they do things by hand, and they have to, to feel uh, the proper postures and the tensions inside the joints of uh, these children. But those objects are made out of plaster. They are heavy. Uh, you can't wash them. You can't replicate them. And most of all, it's like a sticker with written, uh, I'm sick or I'm different. And this is incredibly heavy for a kid. So just 3D print something, make it fun, make it colorful, uh, decorate it. It moves the, the focus from uh, the problem to a sort of toy or some, something playful that it's a plus for the kid. And it also helps a lot these uh, this children to get integrated with their pairs. Another thing that it was really uh, shocking to me they, have, they don't have toys very often. So um, some cerebral conditions create problems in decoding what we see. And uh, you perfectly see and you perfectly understand what you see, but you don't decode what you see. So uh, we allow the kids to design their own toys 
You see them sketching on a piece of paper what they wanted. And from there, with embroidery machines, industrially used to embroider logos on uh, sweaters, we bring the object to life and we create toys that they can use and recognize because they have been part of the design process. A uh, postural saddle that helps to keep the proper posture. And there's a lot of projects, but I want to focus on two examples. One is Glypho, designed by uh, some of my former students, that is actually designed to be parametric, so everybody can fill a form that you can see here, taking a couple of measures, and uh, these amazing guys will produce one for you and want to fit perfectly the need that you have. And not just dimensions, of course, but uh, colors as well, that it's important for a kid. In this specific case, the design process integrates the families on one side and the therapist on the other. So the therapists were the ones saying, you have to keep the tool on the outside of the hand, because the inside stimulates the kid to grasp on the object. And that's wrong as a rehabilitation process. So when you work together, you really can combine the knowledge of different people and you get better results. Another example, a bike fan, so I'm happy to bring this, is the bike for uh, Lorenzo, the kid you see here in the picture. Uh, he really wanted the bike and he wanted the bike for almost three years, but the only available solutions were full of you know, handles and screws and adjustments to fit almost every kid with a similar condition. Beside the fact that it's not particularly nice, it was hard to get it and incredibly expensive. So together with the therapist, we designed this bike in every single small details, from the shape of the handlebar, the posture of the seat, the length of the uh, pedals, and, and everything was designed to fit his capability of moving. So now he is biking all the time, and that's great for him because it's an important therapy, but it's also a way to uh, get connected with other kids that bikes every day. From the same parametric model, we adjust the, the design to other kids, and this is the second one, Viola. Of course, it changed uh, the, the color of the bike because Viola wants pink stuff. Um, but you can see the happiness, and that's really rewarding to us. So this is possible only because uh, the flexibility of the production system and the flexibility of the design system. And I'm very happy to be here, and thanks for the invitation, because what you're doing is, is, is great to us and uh, has a great impact. So if you're interested in this project, you can find it in an exhibition during the Design Week in uh, Cascina Cucagna. It's called the Design Collision, and it's a project where we've been invited by Laura Tralde, a great journalist that speaks about design uh, a lot and with a very sharp view. And that's it. Thank you very much. Um, oh, that was a great presentation. In fact, to be very honest, I have goosebumps, really. <laughs> because like, I know that this, there can be so many projects that a Fab Lab can do. And uh, I can tell you from our experience also, the most moving projects are those which are for children and which have a you know, higher purpose than just looking good, right? So I have a few questions, and uh, you know, maybe we can open it to the audience also. But um, so what do you think, uh, like when designing for everyone, like what are your thoughts on how design plays a very important role uh, in that exercise? Well, we are, we are both designers, yeah. as we were saying. Yeah. Um, and Designers has been a connection point even in the production system before we got to this revolution. Yeah. So uh, before design, uh, the industrial production uh, didn't keep in mind uh, the user or how people behave or uh, what's comfortable, how you can uh, tackle some uh, behave, behavioral um, ways to use things to improve right. some, some aspects. And, and I think that right now we are at the second stage of this, um, in which you can uh, customize things, uh, involve uh, the users into the design process, and that's like a sort of next level yeah. somehow. Yeah. So it's like 
first let's industrialize technology. Now it's about how humanize technology. Exactly. Right? <laughs> it should be the other way around maybe, but anyways, yeah. The other thing uh, I was also thinking was when you were explaining Clifo. Mm -hmm. um, so how, so how, what was your experience in, in the co-design part or, you know, including uh, the involving the customers or your users in the design process? It, it, it completely changed the role of designer, uh, as we know. Um, fan fact, industrial design in Italy started as a sort of um, um, a humble evolution of architecture. Yep. Um, so at the beginning, designing for industries was like a, a step down from uh, designing a building. Yeah. And, and then it became uh, an, a noble profession and something that has an impact on people. And there are amazing stories of the master of the Italian design, such as uh, Castiglioni, that speaks about this. Mm -hmm. So co-design is the next step in the same direction. You have to be humble enough to accept that the user knows the mm -hmm. problem better than you. Yeah and uh, be able to listen to them and involve them in the process really helps to get something that is very effective and that's in the end our goal. Yeah, well, I completely understand and I agree with this. When I was a student, they used to say industrial designer means in dust, real designer. <laughs> so you have to be in the dust, you know, really yeah. to be a designer. It's a nice right. definition. Yeah. <laughs> and. Um, so, and what about local communities? Because, you know, when we talk about fab labs and maker spaces, it's all, the, the, the local community component is very, very strong. So, what, what do you think, like, can you give us any example in which uh, your fab lab is working with the local communities and empowering it? Um, there are plenty of examples. Um, what I think it's, it's the most important point is that innovation today happens uh, on the boundaries between different worlds. So uh, you have innovation when you put together the patients and the doctors and the designers and you create a boundary between these three areas. Mm -hmm. And at that corner, uh, innovations happen. And, and Fab Lab somehow is a sort of catalyst that works in this, day, in this way. So we are connected globally. We have the similar technologies, but we work on the ground with you know, the, the, the people next to us. And um, the, the problems that you try to solve sometimes are very specific, like uh, the case of Lorenzo with his bike. But then you open up to the rest of the network and you realize that there are similar things that happens everywhere and yeah. people are, you know, happy to yeah. share the, the solution that they find. Yeah. But it's really interesting because when I, I started uh, this job, I was very apprehensive, to be very honest. Some of my colleagues uh, know that. That, I, you know, so I did my, uh, after design, I got into MBA, and MBA actually kind of spoils you. It tells you that, you know, don't trust people, trust money, right? Where the money is coming from and all that stuff, right? But so I was always thinking that why would people make if you give, give them tools, and why would people collaborate, you know? Everybody is paying all these legal fees to, to you know, secure their IPs and all that mm. stuff. So what has been your insight? Do people really want to collaborate? N not always. Not <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not lying here. It's not an easy process, yeah. exactly because of what you said. So um, the industrial production somehow spoiled us yeah. uh, with uh, amazing products, uh, very well designed in all the aspects, very cheap compared to the functionality that you get. And that's great, we, we don't want to go there. But still, there are areas where the uniqueness of each one of us emerge. And, and, and that uniqueness can't be fit, sold, uh, supported by a standardized product. Yeah. And that's just about products. Then there's the entire process of being empowered. So. If you step in a mall and buy something out of the shell, the, of, of the shelf, sorry, um, you, you, you're not doing an active process. You're selecting what is in front of you and pick up the best. Yeah. While if you start to think about what, what's the problem, what, 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 is this, what is the problem in reality, so what are you tr trying to solve or what are you struggling with, that changes the perspective of things and makes you an uh, active element of the process. Yeah. Great. No, I understand. Um, 
I want to open it to the audience. Anybody has a question? Okay. Oh, you have? Uh, uh, okay. Hello, it's more a comment than a question. We started the day with the uh, Giro lift, which is just behind us. And uh, Lambert giving us some, uh, telling us about uh, starting a, a business with um, users and usage in mind and how robotics uh, can help. And here again, we're, we're back to, to, to this, um, helping out um, people who, who might need it and whose, mm -hmm. well, this world of standardization. Uh, where they don't find their space, really, in this world of standardization and where we're all being asked to be more or less standardized. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in the middle, we had this great demonstration by Mario Carpo of, uh, with a bit of uh, theory. So I'm, I'm just very pleased to see uh, how this is being uh, explored in many different ways throughout the day. So I just want to, want to thank you. And I think it, it helps us um, understand that pushing technology is not always the answer. You said it has to remain accessible and simple, and you're very proud of that. Um, and I think it's just uh, another food for thought today, another takeaway for today, to say uh, where do we stand in this technology continuum, and where do we want to be? Sometimes we need to be out there, but sometimes we, we need to be as close as possible to uh, the human being. So thank you very much for, for this contribution. Yeah, thanks to you. I, I think yeah, that's, that's a very fair comment I was also thinking about like your journey from being a designer to a fab lab manager and actually enabling uh, because you know as a designer you want to have the control of the process right it's all about that but when you co-design with somebody um, you know at some level of your personality and your self you have to give control you have to yeah. surrender the control and let them be in the driver's um, you know position which is like an evolution of the, the personality in itself. But uh, one, one last question you know, uh, is about how have you seen that you know, the business models around uh, you know, what you do have changed? Do they need to change more? So what is, what's happening around them? Uh, th that's a definitely a very important part. And uh, it's a part that has been partially explored. Um, and then again, technologies can help us on this. So um, a while ago, it had been impossible to track who's downloading or printing something. Uh, right. uh, now it's totally feasible. Um, so technologies must be complex when you were talking about being advanced. That's totally fundamental. I mean, uh, the point is that a lot of things can happen under the hood that you don't need to see. That's an amazing concept about uh, resolution. So um, I, I can speak to you through electronics uh, and um, uh, radio waves uh, and amazing technologies, but we don't need to understand that to enjoy the fact that we are capable of doing this. So uh, business model is another technology somehow that can be very complex, empowered by other technologies, but we still have to understand how to bring that in connection with people. And that happens in two different ways. One is to teach to the designers that there is an aspect of sustainability, mm -hmm. that it's different from uh, uh, getting rich. So sometimes when you speak about business, someone think about, OK, how to get rich. No, that's yeah. another, another thing, is speculation. Right. <laughs> so uh, define a business model is to understand how to be sustainable and how to uh, increase the impact of what you do. Yeah. And that's the designer part or the maker part. And then there's the, the company's part that has the possibility to develop something that enables others to develop their own businesses and create a business over that. And that's yeah. great, you know? Yeah. So uh, we have uh, distributed uh, manufacturing systems. We have distributed knowledge network. We have um, uh, online uh, 3D modeling tools created by you as well. Right. And, and we still miss an online uh, uh, business model that allows people to 
design, test, uh, produce locally and globally and exchange value over the process. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so how would you summarize this discussion? Like what, are the, what do you think would you be, if, for example, let me put it this way. If somebody has to follow your path, like w w what you are doing in, in your fab lab, what, you, what suggestion would you give them uh, given that you, know, you, you might have ma made some mistakes and what are the quick learnings? Okay. Um, I, I would say that designers sometimes are looking for projects in the wrong place. So uh, because it's what we studied in university or because it's uh, what we are used to work on, we focused always over the same kind of uh, industry, markets, projects, objects. Yeah. And that's not where the designer can have an impact. So um, first point, starting point of everything would be to understand what's a real problem that access that impact people, even if at the beginning it seems like only four people. It's not going to be. Yeah. Worldwide, it's going to be tens of thousands, probably. So start with something real and start with something unusual. Because mm -hmm. again, innovation happens on the boundaries between different yeah. worlds. And design and furniture are not different worlds anymore. Yeah. But maybe design and uh, poverty in education is. Yeah, OK. So I think uh, design, uh, starting with unusual and some, with something real, I think that's, that's a big yeah. takeaway from here. OK, great. great. Thank you so much, Enrico. Thanks it was great to having you for the invitation. Yeah, thank Thanks. you.